Um, well, well I, I was actually quite, uh, beside, before I answer the question, I would like to make a comment on the analogy you made that, you know, um, the buildings, you said, it was more or less buildings and their bees, you know, we, like a beehive busy, um, might be quite an in interesting analogy because the bees only have one queen bee, queen bee producing. So it's more or less like Singapore, not enough of producers. <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, uh, the, the question that I would like to ask you now is that um, we always say that Singapore has no natural resources. No natural resources. What do you call our biodiversity? We've got very rich biodiversity, which we can use for our biomedical, biotechnology, and those our natural assets, our national assets, isn't that our natural resources and resources? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm not a biology major, so I don't know much about biodiversity. But don't take the beehive or the ant, uh, all in the beehive, beehive and ant colony are all female. There are no males there. The male job is to supply his sperm and get out. It's all female, and so taking it aside. But strictly speaking, if you look at uh, the way we are structured, it's very little diversity. If you look at our waters, we're highly industrialized. You don't have much swamp land left. I don't think you have many mangrove land left. So I'm not too sure how much diversity you have. We are really a city, you know. If you want to have diversity in our neighbors, south, south of Singapore, Riau Islands, there are about over 500 islands. So for us, as a pure city, I don't see how much diversity. Our diversity actually comes from talent. Boring people, making Singapore be livable, attract people because we are a hub. And that's the way I see. I, I can't see Singapore as a... Everything that we eat is important. Every vegetable that we eat is important. Who grows vegetables in Singapore? We have a few people in Tom's Road. And the people who live are called organic farming. Uh, that's it. So as far as we're concerned, we are a pure city. It's like New York City. There are no farms in New York City. Okay? So, I'm, I'm not a great advocate of biodiversity because I don't see it. I don't people believe they have. We hope very soon when we... Uh, we hope that when we uh, broaden the city in the garden uh, an initiative, we will show you. But maybe if you allow me to just share with you what biodiversity we have. Um, we have 256 species of hard corals in Singapore. The world has 800 hard coral species. We have about one third of the world's hard coral species. And hard corals, as you realize, that has very, very you know, uh, uh, important significance. You know, all Singaporeans love seafood, our coral fish and all the rest. And plus, all the biomedical industries and biotechnology industries can actually research on our biodiversity. Uh, we have 50, sorry, I'll just go on and on and on, but I'll just yeah, stop yes. somewhere. <laughs> I'll just stop somewhere, just to sorry. give you a bit of a teaser. Uh, 50, well, or stimulator, um, uh, stimulation there, 50 species of sea anemones in Singapore. And the world expert in sea anemones told us, it's from the expert's mouth, not us, not from NPARS, uh, saying that there are more sea anemone species in the whole of Singapore, then the north, the western coast of whole of North America. And this is just our marine biodiversity, not talking about... And again, we have 150 new species of long-legged flies. I know you always think that flies are for swapping, but they, they're an important ecological component here. And again, our micro fungi, micro algae, they're all potential biofuels. I consider that to you. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe there's some time that we could persuade you to actually think that we do have natural resources. Thank you. Thank you. If, if, if you allow me to... If you allow me to ask you a, a kind of a funny question. Recently there was a report in news uh, in Straits Times about you commenting on iPad users calling them dummies, right? Okay. But I guess we... I, maybe this is an opportunity for you to explain a little bit what... Uh, people talk were, from my audience were St. Joseph people, for the SGI and And one of the things I was discussing was basically uh, business practices. I was in Boston one month before the event, and it was all at the Lumini, and it was recorded by Razor, on the, on the, you can see on Razor TV. 
So I said, when I went to the shop in Cambridge, that's, uh, Cambridge Gallery, I went to Apple shop, I bought my iPad. I noticed people were playing the touchscreen with comics, all kinds of downloadable, all kinds of applications. And then each of them, 99 cents, dollar ninety-nine, cheaper than a Starbucks coffee. You know? So I said, this, what, you are, what Apple is selling is not an iPad, a computer is selling a spanning machine. It's a spanning machine. You have an iPad, your iTunes, your app, you're just buying 99 cents, a dollar ninety-nine. you don't feel the pain. And once you buy the machine, you are using it as, as an ATM. I mean, you're spending money. It's a great business model because what they sell is not the iPad. They sell you as a customer buying apps, songs, whatever. So forever, so long as you own a machine, you're just spending money. So I say, it takes, for 99 cents, you know, it doesn't feel painful, it's very gullible. Any, and the application is so easy to use, you don't need a manual. But I say it's designed for dummies, and dummies are 99% of the population. Yeah, I must say that. If you, you design a product for geniuses, it's a very small market. So I'm using this, and this, they took out that part, put it on the web, and then say, Filio says, all Apple users are dummies. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> in fact, the joke is that I have about six iPads in my home, three version one, three version two. I have spent lots of money on the application because the apps are cheap. And not all the apps I buy, I use, because it's just 99 cents, a dollar, nine, nine. The most expensive one I bought was 49.99. It was uh, Omni Graphics. Fantastic graphic software, but hardly used. So I told Newton better use it. <laughs> but the trick is that what you are buying, when you buy a notebook, you buy a computer, you don't spend any more money. Other than Microsoft forcing you to upgrade Windows 7, Windows 8. Windows. When you buy an iPad, it's your personal spending uh, ATM. Very, very uh, easy to use. And anybody, if you ever give your iPad to your three year old and you register as iPad, Apple user, the poor kid will start clicking, you download, next thing you have a big fat bill. <laughs> it's, a very it's very impulsive. So I say the business of Apple is not just selling hardware, it's selling a customer an experience. And it's a business model most people have not thought about. You buy a Dell, you buy a HP one time. You buy an iPad or iPhone, you're spending money other day. Something is nice. I just download 10 applications just now. $1.99, $2.99, I don't feel the pain. Because I have a U.S. account, so I can do that. I don't know about people in Singapore. So you find it's very compulsive. So the key is Apple is selling is a device that you feel is easy to use. Anybody can use. Two years old kids can use. Grandmothers can use. And the key is they make money from people downloading. Now, downloading the apps. Most of the apps are very smart. They sign it free first. After that, you try to upgrade. <laughs> in fact, what I call it today is a great con game. Conning people to spend money. Yeah, so, it's a great business model. In fact, uh, the revenue of Apple last quarter, although the stock price went down, was something like 36% uh, increase, 59% increase in revenue and profits. Yeah. And most of the profits, you, there's, a, there's a nice diagram I passed to my staff. More and more of the profits, especially in the apps, and that long road. What does it cost to buy an app? There's nothing to deliver, nothing to ship. For every app you buy, a 99 cents, 30% goes to Apple. Pure cream. Yeah, whereas it's uh, Angry Bird. Now there's a different version of Angry Bird you pay. First one is free. So it's a very smart business model. So when someone asks me, oh, why can't Creative do it? Creative sell you a product. They're not selling you a spending habit. So that was the way I used it. And I said, you make money by selling a spending habit to people who don't feel the pain. People feel it's easy to use. If you're gullible, buy it. You know, nothing wrong being gullible. Nothing wrong being a dummy. I didn't call him an idiot. <laughs> so I made a distinction between a dummy and idiot. A dummy, there's hope, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, there's one question. Uh, please come to the mic. Yeah, um, Sharon Siddiqui. <laughs> I, I'm not listening to you. I'm watching people listening to you. <laughs> no, I, I, about your management style, um, I just wondered what your position was and how you felt about KPIs and the whole concept of key performance indicators. Like someone asking me, a young recruit says, give me my career path. I say, if someone asks my career path, I want to hire a person. 
why you want to define yourself and limit yourself to this is what you're going to do? Well, I, will, I will stay with the company so long as the job is interesting and challenging. So KPI is quite discouraging. It means you force me to do these things and beyond that I don't want to do. But you allow the initiative, the driver person to do as much as you can. I have never had KPI. In fact, I don't follow KPI. I do what I think I want to do and that's it. You don't like it, it's your problem. No, it's very, it is very discouraging to have KPI. If everybody follows KPI, you must use the machine to do the job. There's no more drive, there's no more initiative, there's no more flexibility. I, I don't see it. So long as you're given a job to do, you get a job down. How you get there is up to you. Which means there's no boundary on me. So when I run an I don't force KPI on people. Yesterday, I just shared a board meeting. One of the companies I'm which I'm involved, they had to borrow maybe 10 million euro or Swiss franc. Euro was 4.5%. Swiss franc at that time was 3.5%. 2004. Well, they took Swiss franc. Now the Swiss franc got the rule. By any KPI, these guys over bought the wrong currencies. They didn't have a cover. But at that point in time, in hindsight, he's just doing a job to save 1%. Well, why do I own near him on KPI? See, when I work for Dr. Go, I have no KPI. So long I get my job done, you can't find me. I'm somewhere in China eating my noodles. <laughs> yeah. In fact, when I run my staff, I don't care where my staff is, so long as the work is done. Some owners want to see the people in the table and chair. In fact, what I did was, I have very few tables and chairs. They're forced to hang around everywhere as well. <laughs> so I have only so many tables and chairs. And I learned to come in. They use the table for a meeting and they out. They may sit on the bottom garden working the job. They save me rental space anyway. So KPI actually is quite a limiting factor. I know you need the people have some guidelines, some goals. And leave the rival to that goal to the person. If the person is happy, there's no limit to how much he can perform. That's where, which by civil service, uh, this is a heresy. Uh, 